Well, this is one of the, the first time I think I've preached at Talbot Chapel where Dr. Feinberg was not hanging on the wall looking at me. <laughs> and, and just so you know, I mean, I keep looking over there because I'm worried, you know, that he's going to pop up. Uh, but uh, he was a great mentor. He came to Christ through chosen people, missionaries. Actually, his name was John Solomon witnessing to the Jewish people in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, a very Jewish area in the 20s. Dr. Feinberg at that time was not a doctor. He was an 18-year-old rabbinical student, uh, really looking for a relationship with God, got a tract at his door, uh, eventually uh, was witnessed to by uh, one of the uh, folks that worked for his family, and ended up on John Solomon's doorstep. And John Solomon eventually led Dr. Feinberg uh, to the Lord. He, he was in I believe one of the first classes at Dallas Seminary, got his PhD at Johns Hopkins, came here to teach at Church of the Open Door at that little Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and then initiated the graduate school under Dr. Lewis Talbot, the, what became known as Talbot uh, Seminary, good friends with all of the founders of Biola, and has written all sorts of books and has impacted me uh, personally, has impacted tons of Jewish believers and Gentile believers uh, in many different ways. Therefore, you never know what one person is going to do. You never know. So I realize that sharing the gospel with a Jewish person can be painful. <laughs> but it's a pain that's worth it. Because oftentimes when Jewish people come to the Lord, it's either all or nothing. I was uh, speaking with... Uh, Dr. Feinberg's son, John, who is still teaching a bit at Trinity in Chicago. And uh, we were just talking over uh, Dr. Feinberg's life and some experiences I had with Dr. Feinberg while I was at Talbot. I had him for Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus hermeneutics, my first time out of the block. And uh, 100 guys, really ugly school at that time, no women. And all the guys were in, in ties like me. And this is my New York missionary outfit, just so you know. And, and uh, anyway, so I, I was asking his son, John, about Dr. Feinberg and about his life and so on. And it turns out he married a, a Jewish believer. And, uh, and they were married for many, many years. And it just so happens that both sides of their families actually never talked to them again. So they never had a relationship with their families since they were in their 20s. Isn't that remarkable that that happens? So I thank God this morning that I continued to have a relationship with my family. But it was pretty tenuous because we were raised in a traditional Jewish home. And then when I became a believer, I couldn't be quiet about it. And therefore, um, I wasn't invited places. <laughs> and I. Uh, I almost didn't make it to a Passover Seder one year because my mother said, you must not say anything. And I said, OK. But in the middle of that Seder, boy, I, I, I had to sit on my hands. You know, it's just Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you know? And, but I'm, I'm glad that I had that uh, experience where at, even though my mother was not so open, uh, she allowed me to be uh, part of the family. My father was more secular. My grandparents, my mom's parents, gave me the Feinberg experience, actually. As much as I love them, they never talked to me again once they knew I was a believer. My mom begged me not to tell them I was in my second year at Talbot, and I was about to get married to the most beautiful Jewish believer in Los Angeles. Who happens to be here? Look at that. Sahaba is here. <laughs> That's Dr. Zahava Glazer, who teaches at the Feinberg Center in New York City as well. And so my grandparents never talked to me again. Uh, but my mother allowed me to have some ongoing conversations with her. But let me tell you about the first one. So I became, uh, I was a nice, self-respecting, not bothering anybody, Jesus freak, uh, living in, in San Francisco, and uh, hitchhiked home to New York City, in order to uh, tell my whole family about Jesus, figuring everybody would just accept the Lord because, I mean, how could you say you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus when my mother knew I was Jewish? I mean, if anybody knew I was Jewish, my mother knew I was Jewish. And so, so I came back, 
And I was a believer for about, oh, long time. I was a believer for about six weeks, knew a lot. Still had never visited a church because Jesus freaks didn't go to those things. And Jewish ones definitely didn't go. So I, so I, didn't, I didn't know much about church. And I, I walked in, into the house. And uh, I, for some reason, I just didn't tell my parents I was coming back. And I also forgot to tell them I was enrolled at Bible college. I it just missed, I just forgot, you know. And so I, I, I knock on the door. They're now living in a suburb of New Jersey. My mother opens the door and, and looks at me and says, oh, you're home, you're home, how wonderful. You know, long hair, you know, everything. What she didn't see was I, on my overalls, I had a, a gold and purple cross stitched on the back of it, <laughs> which would not have been cool for my parents. But anyway, so there I was, and uh, my mom said, come in, come in, sit down, eat something, you're skinny, you know, and, and uh, we sat down, and my mother, my father comes down, everybody's happy, and my mother says, so how long are you going to be here? I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm coming home, I'm moving home. She says, oh, that's wonderful, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go to college. And she said, what's that? I said, I'm going to go to a <coughs> Bible college. She said, what's a Bible college? I said, Mom, that's where they study the Bible. She said, this will give you an idea. She said, you? <laughs> what do you think she meant by that? Anyway, so then, then I said, then she said, what are you going to do? Are you going to become a rabbi? I said, maybe not exactly, uh, as you have it in your mind. Anyway, so there was that moment there, my father's looking at me, my mother's looking at me, waiting for an explanation, and so I used my Jesus freak training and, and did what I was trained to do. I was trained to do sensitive evangelism, and I just looked at both of them, I said, Mom, Dad, you're both going to hell. <laughs> Would you have done something differently? <laughs> Try that on your Jewish friend and see what happens. So I said, you're both going to hell, but you don't have to go to hell because Jesus is coming back really any second. <laughs> and if you believe in him, you'll go to heaven and we'll all be together forever. And I smiled. My mother then said, okay, so, uh, so you can leave. <laughs> and actually they threw me out of the house. But I came back after three or four days. Jewish guilt cuts both ways. So it, it worked in my favor. But after, after I started a Bible study in their living room and all the Jewish neighbors were upset, that's when I had to move into the dorms, Bible schools. But so that night I said to my mom, can I just tell you why I believe that Jesus is the Messiah? She says, okay, but no New Testament, no crosses. I said, okay, I won't use any crosses. She was a little upset about the thing on my back. So no crosses and I won't even use the New Testament. That's because I knew nothing about it. So I said, I said, so let me give you my, tell you about my favorite Bible passage. So I opened up and I began reading Isaiah chapter 53. And I began reading Isaiah 53 because when I was seeking the Lord, I read Isaiah 53 and it was very convincing to me. So I thought it would naturally would convince my mother. So I said, I began reading Isaiah 53. And I think about verse seven, she fell asleep. And then she, I, I, I pushed her and she said, I poked her and she said, look, I told you not to read the New Testament. Now you've heard that stuff before maybe, but that really happened with my mother. I said, mom, that's not the New Testament. He's our guy, that's Isaiah. And she said, I don't care whose guy he is. It sounded a lot like the New Testament. So I told you not to read it. The conversation's over. You had your chance. That's it. Now, if I have time, I'll tell you what happened later. But this silence went on for probably 35 years plus. 35 years. So what was she upset about? Well, she was upset about a chapter in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, that was written 700 plus years before Jesus ever came. That is one little chapter among 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah the prophet, if you take Bible survey, you know there are two, probably two parts to Isaiah, although I only believe there's one Isaiah, hope you do, hope Talbot's still teaching that. So there's one Isaiah, two major parts, chapters one through 39, 
judgment, suffering. If you ever want to do a study, home Bible study in Isaiah, just start at chapter 40, okay? <laughs> you can, you, people will be so depressed. I mean, it's terrible. It's a little bit of hope, but not much. And then chapters 40 through 66, we've got a bright and glorious future for the people of Israel and all people. And sandwiched, like the corned beef in a sandwich, right in between there, in chapter 53, in chapter 53, is the message of this divine servant of the Lord who would both die for our sins and rise from the dead. And so Isaiah chapter 53 is pivotal because, now this is gonna, I learned this at Talbot, you're gonna think this is brilliant. Without the first company coming, there'd be no second coming. Think about that one. <laughs> I learned that from, uh, no, I can't blame anybody about that one. But the hope that we have for the future a glorious, wonderful future that God has promised is all founded and based on the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, died for our sins and rose from the dead, and therefore sin can be thoroughly removed from all of us and from this world, and the curse will be lifted. Joyful, joyful, right? So in chapter 53, if you have your Bibles, just a, a few quick words uh, on it. There's a debate as to where Isaiah 53 begins because, as you probably know, these were all written and still are written on scrolls. And so the chapters and verses, which are so wonderful to have in order to know, be able to do your homework, but the chapters and verses are great, but they're not, of course, in the original. And there are a lot of theories about where Isaiah 53 starts, but it's definitely not in chapter 53, verse 1. One of the latest theories, based a little bit on the Dead Sea Scrolls, is Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Let me read it to you. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That's only one Hebrew word, by the way. Who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. We don't know exactly what the good news is, but we know that people who bring it have really, really nice feet. And they announce shalom, peace. So we know that the good news brings peace. It's good news of happiness, the Hebrew word tov, which can also mean beautiful, like a lot of, a lot of you are tov on the inside and a lot of you are tov on the outside. And so, you know, you're good looking and beautiful. So it brings good news of happiness or goodness who announces salvation. So we know that the good news brings peace, the good news brings happiness or beauty, and the good news sets us free. Well, that's, a, that's pretty good. And says to Zion, your God reigns, the Hebrew word for king, so we also understand that the good news is one wonderful reminder that this world is not completely out of control, but that the God of the universe is still in control. So I don't know about you, but whatever this good news is, I want it. I want it. It's got great qualities. But we don't know what it is. We get little hints of it as to who it's for. In verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. So we now understand that whatever this good news is, which we don't know what it is yet, we know that it's not just for Jewish people, but it's for everybody. You find that good news? Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? And so the good news is for all peoples, for Jews and for Gentiles, but we still don't know what the good news is. And then we begin in verse 13, which many people will say verses 13 through 15 is kind of an executive summary of Isaiah 53, the 12 verses in chapter 53, and almost everything you learn in the 12 verses, you, le you learn in verses 13 through 15. And that's partially true, I think. Daniel will correct me uh, next week. So, behold, my servant, he nay. That's, that means, let me have your attention. My servant, ebed, the Hebrew word, will prosper right then and there we have something that's really odd. I mean, it's a strange story. Because in the Old Testament, if you became one of these, a servant, which really is uh, also a slave, if you became a servant or a slave, it's because you lost the farm. 
And according to the book of Leviticus, you had to, in order for your family to eat, if it wasn't a jubilee year, which, man, that took 50 years. You could, you know, if, if, you, if you lost the farm in year two, you had a long way to go. And so you're not going to get your land back. And so in order to eat, you indenture yourself to another Israelite. After seven years, if you like the way you're being treated, you can get an earring in your ear. And I can see some of you have, are indentured, which is good. <laughs> and so you then become, so, so to speak, a slave to that person who takes care of you and your family. And so you actually have a couple of images here. My servant will prosper. There's a lot of discussion on that Hebrew word prosper. Take my word for it without getting into depth. It means prosper. So my servant will prosper. So you have to ask yourself the question, how does a servant or a slave prosper? Whether you believe that prospering is with money or with influence or whatever it is, how does a slave prosper? I mean, in the Old Testament, it's not like you get a, get a part-time job at Starbucks. So how do you prosper. Well, it gives you two images of the servant of the Lord, which is important from where we start. My wife, uh, Zahava, grew up uh, in, I grew up in the Holy Land, Brooklyn, New York, just to get that, <laughs> get that straight. She grew up in a second Holy Land. You think it's Jerusalem, it really is Buenos Aires, Argentina. And her mom would uh, always tell her, Sahava wanted a lot, of, a lot of stuff, I mean, really demanding stuff like a bicycle and a puppy. You know, she's got the puppy, but we're still thinking about the bike. And uh, her mom would tell her, when the Messiah comes, you'll get a bicycle, you'll get a puppy. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the Jewish version of Christmas, only it's Hanukkah, you know? And so all good things will come when the Messiah comes because that's the understanding modern Jews have of the coming of the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, he will raise the dead. He will uh, establish the kingdom in the land of Israel with Jerusalem the capital. All those things we read in the Bible about the second coming, the Messiah will do at his only coming in the Jewish mindset. You can go back to the first century and argue, no, there were some people that believed in a humble Messiah. That is true. There is a minority report that there are two Messiahs in very traditional Judaism really, really embedded in Jewish tradition. A Messiah, son of Joseph, who is a suffering Messiah. A Messiah, son of David, who is a reigning Messiah. Ask your Jewish friends about this. They will have no clue as to what you're talking about. Okay, it's a minority report. It's in there, but it's a minority report. But it comes from Jewish scholars over the years trying to figure out how you have these two images of the Messiah because there is clear evidence in Jewish tradition in the various Targumim and other writings in Jewish, Jewish history, that Isaiah chapter 52 and all the way through 53 could very well have been messianic in one way or another. And so my servant will prosper. You have a humble servant. You have a prospering servant. You have two images of the Messiah. Some people think you have two messiahs. I think you have one messiah united by the resurrection but I have the vantage point of looking at it from the other side. So look at it. My servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The last time Isaiah used that phrase was in chapter 6. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and greatly exalted, and his train or his robe filled the temple. So the last time Isaiah uses these words, he's using it to describe God. Well, the plot really thickens now, huh? So he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. That ver word for marred is, is intense. It's almost someone got disfigured. And so it seems that on the journey from humiliation to glorification, that Whoever that servant is, he is marred and scarred on the way. Getting to sound a little more familiar, maybe. In verse 15, this is one of those difficult little statements that make you want to just read a psalm and not study Isaiah. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. What in the world is he talking about? He will sprinkle many nations. That Hebrew word for sprinkle is borrowed from the first five, six chapters of the book of Leviticus. And that word for sprinkle, 
doesn't really have a whole lot to, to do with water. It has a lot to do with atoning blood because the high priest once a year paved his way into the Holy of Holies by drawing aside the curtains of the holy place. And he had, came face to face with the altar and the Shekhinah, the glory of God resting on the mercy seat. And he took the blood of the bull and the goat and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of the people. And so this is a metaphor for sure. And the metaphor means this that somehow this servant of the Lord will sprinkle atoning blood not only on behalf of the Jewish people, but on behalf of the nations of the world. Which really harkens back to verse 10, so it makes sense. So whatever this deliverance he's going to do, this servant, he's going to do it for all. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. What had been, not been told will, not be, will be seen, but what they had not heard, they will understand. They will be stunned. And then in chapter 53, you're pretty familiar with all of this. We read about uh, his suffering and his humility. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, a root out of parched ground. Nothing about him that should be attractive to us. In fact, verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with, with grief, like one whom men hid their face from. He was despised and we didn't esteem him. He was like a spiritual leper. We would cross the street. We would hide our face because in those days they believed leprosy was communicated through the air, through breathing. And so this person was not a royal messianic king to be welcomed. He was some kind of deserving sinner who was suffering and we didn't want to go near him because we don't like to be around people who are suffering. And then in verse 4, something happens is a dramatic veil that's lifted. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression, the Hebrew word for rebellion. He was crushed for our iniquities, the Hebrew word for crookedness. So if the law is a straight line, we're all bent out of shape. And then he says, the chastening for our well-being, again, the Hebrew word shalom, peace, fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. So Isaiah is now telling us, very simply, everything that we deserved for our sinful behavior, he received, and everything that he deserved for his righteous behavior, we received. Now, the Bible has a word for that. It's not unfair. It's actually the word grace, unmerited favor. You and I get exactly what we didn't earn and exactly what we don't deserve. I always told my kids, never ask me for what you deserve. There's a beautiful passage in 2 Corinthians 5.21 where I believe the Apostle Paul, who is quite an Old Testament scholar, the Apostle Paul probably gave a little commentary on Isaiah 53. He made him who knew, what? No sin. To become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My brothers and sisters, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Well, you know the rest of it. Uh, like sheep have gone astray, we turn to our own way. He was oppressed and afflicted. He didn't open his mouth. Peter picks up on, uh, on that and gives us advice on how we should suffer. Then verse 8 is an interesting verse. And Jewish people, of course, have an explanation for all this. You know, we've had you know, a couple thousand years to practice. And so the explanation here is that the servant songs in Isaiah 40, 42, 49, and 52, 53, the servant songs all refer to the nation of Israel. So it's really Israel who suffered and died on behalf of the Gentiles. Now, you look at this text and say, I don't see that in the text. Well, neither do I, which is why I believe in Jesus. <laughs> but that is the typical rabbinic understanding. Once I was handing out tracts at Brooklyn College, a few Jewish students there. Uh, if you really want to, I mean, some of you should just dump Talbot and just come to the Feinberg program, really. You can, you can keep all your, all your credits, you know. 
You could come to the Feinberg program, and then you could go out to Brooklyn College every week and get harassed by Jewish people. And so I was going back and forth with a, with a rabbi, and finally we both got frustrated with each other. And I looked at him and said, you know what, rabbi? If you can prove to me that Isaiah was a Gentile, I'll become a Hasidic Jew and renounce Jesus. And he looks at me, he says, really? I said, absolutely, absolutely. He said, but well, why would you do that? Because you believe, Yeshaya Nun Gimel, Isaiah 53 refers to Israel. He says, yeah, well, I don't study it that much, but I think that's true. And then I said, but I believe it's a direct prophecy of Jesus the Messiah. And he said, no, no. I said, it is. So will you renounce being a Hasidic Jew if I can show you? He said, well, we'll see. <laughs> so we stood there with a Hebrew Bible, read verse 8. He by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered? Now look at this carefully. He was cut off out of the land of the living. That means to be killed. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. My people. So I said to the rabbi, so who were Isaiah's people? Because they seem to have suffered. Who were, I, I mean, they seem to have been suffered for. And I said, who are Isaiah's people? Let's start. Are they Swedish? Italian? <laughs> Jewish? Who are Isaiah's people? Obviously, Isaiah was Jewish. So if the usual Jewish translation or understanding, interpretation, is true, it means that the Jewish people were killed for the sins of the Jewish people. So I looked at the rabbi. I said, does that make sense to you? He says, let me get back to you. I'm waiting. It's been about 25 years. The heart of the message is clear, that Jesus is the Messiah. We can have confidence in this because we stand on the firm ground of Old Testament prophecy. That works for Jews and Gentiles. He is the Messiah. He did suffer and die for us. He didn't deserve it. We receive all good things, including everlasting life, through him. And this is the message that he's called us to proclaim to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. This, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, is the reason for the season. This is what it's all about. The Son of God became the Son of Man in order that we might become the children of God. When you kiss the face of the baby, you're kissing the face of God. You're kissing the one. You're honoring the one who fulfills prophecy, died for our sins, rose again. Some good news. Rest of Isaiah, he's coming back. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.